All right, everybody, welcome back. In this episode, we're going to take Second Chronicles chapter 18. We're going to talk about Jehoshaphat's alliance with Ahab. So Jehoshaphat went to Samaria, Israel's capital, to see Ahab. After flattering Jehoshaphat with an elaborate banquet, Ahab urged him to go to uh, Ramoth Gilead to join him in war against the Arameans. And let's just jump into the uh, verses here. <clears throat> First verse were Jehoshaphat's unwise alliance with Ahab. So Jehoshaphat had riches and honor in abundance, and by marriage he allied himself with Ahab. All right. So because of his personal godliness in Second Chronicles chapter 17 verses 1 through 4, and his public godliness in Second Chronicles chapter 17 verses 7 through 10, God blessed Jehoshaphat and exalted him among neighboring nations. And uh, he, by marriage, he allied himself with Ahab. This manner of linking kingdoms by the bond of marriage was common in the ancient world, yet it was an unwise policy for Jehoshaphat. The wisest strategy for the protection of his kingdom was obedience instead of compromise with an ungodly king Ahab of Israel and his wife, Queen Jezebel. All right. First Kings chapter 16 verses 29 through 33 will tell us just how bad Ahab was. He introduced the worship of completely new pagan gods. In his disobedience, Jeroboam, the first king of the kingdom of the northern tribe, said, I will worship the Lord, but do it my way. Ahab said, I want to forget about the Lord completely and worship Baal. And Ahab was greatly influenced toward wickedness by his Phoenician wife, Jezebel, and she's a critical character to understand. He was a weak man, uh, the tool of a crafty, unscrupulous, and cruel woman, and some of the worst crimes that have ever been committed have been wrought by weak men at the instigation of worse but stronger spirits than themselves. All right, let's take verses 2 and 3, where Ahab sets his eyes upon Ramoth Gilead. After some years, he went down to visit Ahab in Samaria, and Ahab killed sheep and oxen in abundance for him and the people who were with him, and persuaded him to go out with him to Ramoth Gilead. So Ahab, king of Israel, said to, Je to Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, Will you go with me against Ramoth Gilead? And he answered him, I am as you are, and my people are as your people. We will be with you in the war. All right. So previously, the king of Syria promised to return certain cities to Israel in 1 Kings chapter 20, verse 34, in exchange for leniency after a defeat in battle. Apparently, this was a city that Ben-Hadid never returned to Israel, and it was a strategically important location. And the king Ahab of Israel asked King Jehoshaphat of Judah to help him in this dispute against Syria. This made some sense because Ramoth Gilead was only 40 miles from Jerusalem. All right. So we're going to talk about this alliance with the north. And this is one of the strangest partnerships in the Bible. One result of Jehoshaphat's formidable strength was his attractiveness to Ahab, the king of Israel, the northern kingdom, who both feared him and wished to use him as an ally. Ahab was the second king of the Amri dynasty of Israel, the most illustrious family in the northern kingdom's history. He had come to power to about the same time as Jehoshaphat, right? Ahab reigned from 874 to 853 BC. He was related to Jehoshaphat by a marriage alliance. Jehoshaphat's son Jehoram had married Athaliah, Ahab and Jezebel's daughter in um uh, 1 Kings chapter 21 verse 6 and chapter 22 verse 2. So towards the end of Ahab's life in 853 BC, he was engaged in bitter hostilities with the Arameans in the Jordan in 1 Kings chapter 22 verses 1 through 4. So God had given Jehoshaphat peace, but Ahab is asking him to go to war in these passages. All right, verses 4 through 8, Jehoshaphat proposes that they seek God in the matter. Also, Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, Please inquire for the word of the Lord today. Then the king of Israel gathered the prophets together, 400 men, and said to them, Shall we go to war against Ramoth Gilead, or shall I refrain? So they said, Go up, for God will deliver it into the king's hand. But Jehoshaphat said, Is there not still a prophet of the Lord here that, me, that we may inquire of him? So the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, There is still one man by whom we may inquire of the Lord, but I hate him, because he never prophesies good concerning me, but always evil. And he is Micaiah, the son of Imla. And Jehoshaphat said, Let not the king say such things. Then the king of Israel called one of his officers and said, Bring Micaiah, the son of Imla, quickly. Right? He didn't like him because he was always giving him prophecies that went against his, went against his opinion. Uh, 
So considering the generally adversarial relationship between Ahab and the prophets of the real God, uh, this was a bold request of Jehoshaphat to ask of Ahab. And it wasn't surprising that Ahab picked prophets who would tell them exactly what they wanted to hear. And though Jehoshaphat had already committed himself to the enterprise in Second Chronicles chapter 18, verse 3, and though he went on to disregard the guidance that was given to him in Second Chronicles 18, verse 28, he still retained the religion of God to the extent that he insisted on seeking the counsel of the Lord. So when Ahab gathered the prophets, uh, they were not faithful prophets of the Lord, right? These were prophets happy to please their kings and tell them whatever they wanted to hear. And Jehoshaphat still wanted to hear from a prophet of God, the Lord, right? Is there not still a prophet of the Lord here, right? So he's not dealing with the pagans. He wants a real uh, real prophet. And, uh, of course, he says, I hate him because he never prophesies good concerning me, but always evil. Ahab hated the messenger because of the message. And his real conflict was with God, but he focused his hatred against the prophet Micaiah. And he was willing to listen to the king of Judah when he advised that Ahab should listen to the prophet Micaiah. <clears throat> and so, who are these prophets in these passages? They are prophets of Baal, the ones telling King Ahab exactly what he wants to hear. And Jehoshaphat, however, knew the prophets were charlatans, so he asked for a true prophet of the Lord. And the only one available was Micaiah, the son of Imla. But Ahab hated him because he would not compromise his integrity and give Ahab any good words. You can look back at Second Chronicles chapter 18, uh, verse 17, right? All right, verses 9 through 11. An object lesson from the unfaithful prophets. The king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, clothed in their robes, sat on each throne, and they sat at the threshing floor at the entrance of the gate of Samaria. And all the prophets prophesied before them. Now Zedekiah, the son of Jeninah, had made horns of iron for himself, and he said, Thus says the Lord, With these you shall gore the Syrians until they are destroyed. And all the prophets prophesied, so saying, Go up to Ramoth Gilead and prosper, for the Lord will deliver it into the king's hand. So each sat on its, his throne uh, at the threshing floor. This illustrates the ancient custom of holding court and making decisions at the gates of the city. There were even thrones for high officials to sit at the gates of the city of Samaria. And uh, thus says the Lord in these passages by these prophets, these unfaithful prophets, such as Zedekiah, prophesied in the name of the Lord, but they did not prophesy truthfully. Many commentators believe these prophets were pagan prophets, perhaps representatives of Asherah or other pagan gods or goddesses. Yet they clearly prophesied in the name of the Lord. And it's best to regard these not as pagan prophets, but as unfaithful prophets to the true God. And how many unfaithful Christians do we have in the church following today? Right? Not representing the word correctly. So perhaps these were the true followers of God who were seduced by Ahab's sincere but shallow repentance three years before in 1 Kings chapter 21, verses 27 through 29. After that, they began to align with Ahab uncritically, right? They wanted to be politically correct. Three years later, they were willing to prophesy lies to Ahab if that's what he wanted to hear. And of course... This guy is saying, with these you shall gore the Syrians until they are destroyed. Zedekiah used a familiar tool of ancient prophets, the object lesson. He used horns of iron to illustrate the thrust of two powerful forces, armies that would rout the Syrians. Zedekiah had the agreement of 400 other prophets, right? All the prophets prophesied so. So he had his big following. So dramas of this kind were a typical method of prophetic revelation. You can see Jeremiah chapter 27 and 28. And based on this occasion on the horns as a symbol of strength. And this must have been a vivid and entertaining presentation. We can be certain that every eye was on Zedekiah when he used these horns of iron to powerfully illustrate the point. And it was certainly persuasive to have 400 prophets speak in agreement on one issue. No matter how powerful and persuasive the presentation, their message was unfaithful, right? Oftentimes, the massive crowd isn't, uh, isn't doing it right. All right, verses 12 through 15, the prophecy of Micaiah, the faithful prophet. All right, then the messenger who had gone to call Micaiah spoke to him, saying, Now listen, the words of the prophets with one accord encourage the king. Therefore, please let your word be like the word of one of them and speak encouragement. And Micaiah said, As the Lord lives, whatever my God says that I will speak. 
Then he came to the king, and the king said to him, Micaiah, shall we go to war against Ramoth Gilead, or shall I refrain? And he said, Go and prosper, and they shall be delivered into your hand. So the king said to him, How many times shall I make you swear that you tell me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? So the assistant of King Ahab tried to persuade Micaiah to speak in agreement with the 400 other prophets, right? Just agree with everybody else. And Micaiah assured him that he would simply repeat what God said to him, as we should today. The word is very clear. And this was a dramatic scene. Micaiah was brought out from prison. You'll remember from 1 Kings chapter 22, verse 26, right? And that will indicate that he came from prison. We see a prophet in rags and chains stand before two kings, ready to speak on behalf of the Lord. And this might have daunted the good prophet that he had lately seen the Lord sitting upon his throne with all the host of heaven standing by him. And hence he so boldly looked in the face of these two kings and their majesty, for he beheld them as so many mice, right? And so, go and prosper, and they shall be delivered into your hand. When Micaiah said this, his tone was probably mocking and sarcastic. He said similar words to the 400 unfaithful prophets, but delivered a completely different message, right? And he says, how many times shall I make you swear that you tell me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? King Ahab recognized the mocking tone of Micaiah's prophecy and knew that it contradicted the message of the 400 prophets. He demanded that Micaiah tell nothing but the truth, which Ahab believed and hoped was the message of the 400 other prophets. All right, verses 16 and 17, Micaiah speaks the true prophecy from the Lord. Then he said, I saw all Israel scattered on the mountains as sheep that have no shepherd. And the Lord said, These have no master. Let each return to his house in peace. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, Did I not tell you that he would would not prophesy good concerning me but evil? (laughs) I can't help but crack up at this scene. I remember this from uh, when we went through 1 and 2 Kings. Uh, Micaiah was challenged to tell the truth, and now he changed his tone from mocking to serious. And he said that not only would Israel be defeated, but also that their leader, Shepherd, would perish. And King Ahab said that he wanted the truth, but he couldn't handle the truth. And what he didn't consider, uh, what he couldn't consider, was that though Micaiah prophesied evil towards Ahab, he did prophesy truth. And Ahab knew in his heart that Micaiah would not fear or flatter him, but only declare the word of God, right, Jehovah. Thus he construed into personal hatred. Hatred of the messenger of God is clear evidence of willful wickedness. All right, verses 18 through 22, Micaiah reveals the inspiration behind the 400 prophets. Then Micaiah said, therefore, hear the words of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne, and all the host of heaven standing on his right hand and his left. And the Lord said, Who will persuade Ahab, king of Israel, to go up, that he may fall at Ramoth Gilead? So one spoke in this manner, and another spoke in that manner. Then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. The Lord said to him, In what way? So he said, I will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And the Lord said, You shall persuade him, and also prevail. Go out and do so. Therefore, look, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of these prophets of yours, and the Lord has declared disaster against you. So this is a powerful passage here. Pay attention to the details. King Ahab and others at the court found it hard to explain how one prophet could be right and 400 prophets could be wrong. Here, Micaiah explained the message of the 400 prophets. It's possible that this is just a parable, but it is far more likely that Micaiah had an accurate prophetic glimpse into the heavenly drama behind these events. And since the right hand was a place of favor, this may indicate that God spoke to the combined host of heaven, both faithful and fallen angelic beings. And some people will forget that Satan and his fellow fallen angels have access to heaven. People are blown away by that, but you need to look at Job chapter 1 verse 6 and Revelation chapter 12 verse 10. There is a well-intentioned but mistaken teaching that God can allow no evil in his presence, meaning that Satan and other fallen angels could not be in his presence. Not true according to the Bible. These passages show that God can allow evil in his presence, though he can have no fellowship with evil, and one day all evil will be removed from his presence. Revelation chapter 20, verses 14 and 15. <clears throat> And so, who will persuade Ahab, king of Israel, to go up that he may fall? God wanted to bring judgment against Ahab, so he asked this group of the host of heaven for a volunteer to lead Ahab in a battle. Oftentimes, God's going to execute his plan one way or the other, but he will use others as instruments to further his plan. 
And uh, one of these comes forward and says, I'll go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of his prophets. Um, apparently, one of the fallen angels volunteered for this task. Since Ahab wanted to be deceived, uh, God would give him what he wanted, using a willing fallen angel who worked through willing, unfaithful prophets. The Hebrew that underlies the phrase rendered a spirit came forward reads literally the well-known spirit, right? I.e. Satan the tempter, as in Job chapter 1, verses 6 through 12. And apparently, Micaiah seems to assume among his hearers a working knowledge of the book of Job. And this strange incident can only be understood against the background of other Old Testament passages, especially Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 11, and Ezekiel chapter 14, verses 1 through 11. Both these passages speak of people being enticed by false prophets, in each case as a result of link with idolatry. Things they don't teach today in Sunday school, but are very important to your understanding of what's going on in heaven. So Micaiah's ridiculous parable is a subtle way of saying that all these prophets of Baal are a pack of liars. All right, verses 23 through 28, you get the reaction of the false prophets and Ahab. Then Zedekiah, the son of Chenana, went near and struck Micaiah on the cheek and said, Which way did the Spirit from the Lord go from me to speak to you? And Micaiah said, Indeed, you shall see on that day when you go into the inner chamber to hide. Then the king of Israel said, Take Micaiah and return him to Ammon, the governor of the city, and to Joash, the king's son, and say, Thus says the king, Put this fellow in prison and feed him with bread of affliction and water of affliction until I return in peace. But Micaiah said, If you ever return in peace, the Lord has not spoken by me. And he said, Take heed, all you people. All right, so Zedekiah responded the way some do when they are defeated in an argument. He responded with violence. And, of course, they said to put this fellow in prison. King Ahab responded the way many tyrants do when they are confronted with the truth. Ahab wanted Micaiah imprisoned and deprived, right? Feed him with the bread and water of affliction. The phrase bread of affliction and water of affliction may be translated bread and water of scant measure, right? Not good quality. And, uh, of course, he says, if you ever return in peace, then the Lord hasn't spoken by me. And the prophet Micaiah made one final and ultimate appeal. He was willing to be judged by whether this prophecy came to pass or not. And since he knew that his own words were true, it was fitting for him to cry out as they dragged him back to prison. Take heed, all you people. So on hearing that, you know, in these passages, Zedekiah slapped Micaiah, who then predicted that Zedekiah would suffer calamity in the days of Israel's defeat. And Ahab then returned to Micaiah to Ammon, the mayor of Samaria, and Joash, the king's son. The king's son is apparently a title of a royal official, not a literal son of Ahab. Look at Jeremiah chapter 36, verse 26, chapter 38, verse 6, and Second Chronicles chapter 28, verse 7 for that. And Ahab also commanded that Micaiah be imprisoned, but as Ahab left, the man of God once more promised that the king wasn't going to return whole. All right, verse 29, Jehoshaphat and Ahab go into battle. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, went up to Ramoth Gilead, and the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, I will disguise myself and go into battle, but you put on your robes. So the king of Israel disguised himself, and they went into battle. And so... It is easy to understand why King Ahab of Israel went to this battle. He didn't want to believe that Micaiah's prophecy was true and wanted to courageously oppose it. It is less easy to understand why King Jehoshaphat of Judah went to this battle with Ahab. He should have believed the prophecy of Micaiah and known that the battle would end in disaster and the death of at least Ahab. It may be that Jehoshaphat had a fatalistic attitude towards the will of God, figuring that if it was all part of God's will, then there was nothing that he or anybody else could do about it. Um, and, of course, he says, I'll disguise myself and go into battle. But you put on your robes. right?" So going into battle, Ahab did not want to be identified as a king and therefore be a special target. He thought this would help protect him against Micaiah's prophecy of doom. It is more difficult to explain why Jehoshaphat agreed to go into the battle uh, as the only clue, clearly identified king. Perhaps he was either not very smart or he had very great faith, one or the other. So Ahab, Ahab pretended herein to honor Jehoshaphat, but he really intended to save himself and to elude Micaiah's prophecy. <laughs> All right, verses 30 through 34. Jehoshaphat is saved and Ahab dies in battle. Now the king of Syria had commanded the captains of the chariots who were with him, saying, Fight 
with no one small or great, but only with the king of Israel. So it was when the captains of the chariot saw Jehoshaphat that they said, It is the king of Israel. Therefore they surrounded him to attack, but Jehoshaphat cried out, and the Lord helped him, and God diverted them from him. For so it was when the captains of the chariot saw that it was not the king of Israel that they turned back from pursuing him. Now a certain man drew a bow at random and struck the king of Israel between the joints of his armor. So he said to the driver of his chariot, Turn around and take me out of the battle, for I am wounded. The battle increased that day, and the king of Israel propped himself in his chariot facing the Syrians until evening, and about the time of sunset he died. So Ahab's previous mercy to Ben Hadid in First Kings chapter twenty verses thirty one through thirty four did not win any lasting favors with the uh, rulers of Syria. This strategy of the Syrian army made Ahab's counter strategy of disguising himself in battle seem very wise. Thus does the unthankful infidel repay the mercy of his late victor. But God had a holy hand in it, right? So, Jehoshaphat cried out, and the Lord helped him. Uh, finding himself as the only identifiable king in the battle, Jehoshaphat found himself quickly in danger. So he cried out to the Lord and was rescued when they turned back from pursuing him. And a certain man drew a bow at random and struck the king of Israel, the northern king, uh, Ahab. This seems to be pure chance. It was a certain man, and he pulled his bow at random, but it struck as if it were a sin-seeking missile hitting right between the joints of his armor. God orchestrated the unintended actions of man to result in an exercise of his judgment. Frequently, this is the case. Probably this man already had shot many arrows and... He went on in his simplicity, little knowing that this particular arrow was to be guided through all the confusion straight to its mark by the unerring knowledge and power of God. Yet so it was. And men may secrete themselves so that other men may never find them, but when the hour of their judgment has come, God takes hold on some ordinary event and makes it the highway on which he comes to carry out his purpose. It just happened, says the man of the world. God did it, says the man of faith. And now what joy could Ahab's black soul, ready to part, have of his ivory house, right? Who had not rather be a Micaiah in the jail than Ahab in the chariot? Wicked men have the advantage of the way, godly men of the end. Of course, the king of Israel propped himself up in his chariot, facing the Syrians until evening. So Ahab faced the end of his life bravely, dying propped up in his chariot to inspire his troops. When his death became known, the battle was over. And it appears that the Israelites and Jews maintained the fight um, the whole of the day. But when at evening the king died and this was known, there was a proclamation made, probably with the consent of both the Syrians and Israelites that the war was over. Right. So Ahab set Jehoshaphat up as a clay pigeon to be slain in battle, and it was not Jehoshaphat's fight at all, but he almost got killed. And so looking back... Uh, he drew his bow at a venture. He wasn't aiming at anything. This was a random shot. That arrow had old Ahab's name right on it, and it got him. What happened? He died, just as Micaiah said he would die. So the vision of Micaiah. So then Micaiah related a vision in which he saw God commission a demonic spirit to inspire the prophets of Ahab to lie to him in Second Chronicles chapters 18-22, to right? The vision of Micaiah is troublesome to some as it seems to suggest that God is the author of deceit. However, it is clearly just one of many examples of the sovereignty of God who does not initiate evil but sometimes allows it to occur for his own purposes. Right? Evil is already existing in the world, but God's will of dealing with sin will work out regardless. And you can look at 1 Samuel chapter 16 verse 14, Job chapter 1 verse 12, Job chapter 2 verses 5 and 6 and 2 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 7, right? <clears throat> regardless, God will use the instruments of the world to execute his perfection. Says God does not tolerate sin, but his plan will go through nonetheless. And generally, that means allowing people that are already committed sin given over to their own desires. So through man's, you will see constant theme through the Old Testament and even through the New Testament that God will use both man's successes and failures regardless to further his perfect path all the way through with Jesus Christ, ultimately all the way through to the end, to eternity future. All right, that ties up chapter 18 um, in the next chapter. Chapter 19, we will talk about Jehu's rebuke and the goodness of God to Jehoshaphat. Thank you for joining me.